And our subject tonight, of course, are what I've chosen to call cosmic codes, hidden messages from the edge of eternity. And uh, this is the first of a series that will actually be a series, one building upon the other. There has been, of course, a lot of confusion generated by some of the recent books being published. And what we're trying to do is uh, deal with some of the technology behind this. Most people writing in favor of the so-called Bible codes and also those who are writing against them. Both uh, sides of this debate seem to lack, in my opinion, a cryptographic background. And that is, after all, the science that's involved. Uh, We're going to discover a lot of interesting things. First of all, the kinds of codes that are being discussed in the literature today and in the articles and whatever is only one particular kind of a series of codes that are in the Scripture. And uh, But before you really can get at these and evaluate them in any meaningful way, you need a little perspective of this whole business of cryptology, which is the uh, art or science of uh, writing or creating hidden messages, uh, messages that are intended for a specific receiver and denied others. And uh, cryptanalysis is the science of reading them anyway. Uh, and so we're going to talk a little bit about that just to give you a flavor of that before we get into the hidden codes that are in the Bible. We're also going to discover there's lots of different kinds, but the kinds that's creating all the current controversy are a specific kind of code called the equidistant letter sequences. And we'll show you what that means, and we'll talk a little bit about uh, why people are so excited about them. We'll also talk a little bit about the dark side, the dangers of these things. And we'll be tonight focusing on some background first, cryptology background first, and then we'll talk specifically about the equidistant letter sequences, the part that most of you probably have heard about for a variety of reasons. And, uh, but I also want to point out that we're going to, in subsequent sessions, discover that there are another kind of code altogether called microcodes, what Jesus calls the jots or yachts and tittles. And we'll talk about that. We'll talk about the whole nature of uh, these very, very fascinating discoveries that are being made at the micro level. But perhaps the most staggering examples of all, uh, and we'll be hitting those primarily tomorrow afternoon, are the macro codes, macros that, uh, g- that yield the, the strategic structure. And uh, we'll build that case. And, of course, there's another category, meta codes. Those are codes beyond our horizon. We'll touch a little bit on, on those also. But let's just start a little bit about the f- whole science of cryptography, the art of secret writing. And uh, then we're gonna, when we've laid that groundwork, we'll talk a little bit about codes from other worlds, the interest and the, the scientific efforts that have been directed at um, extraterrestrial communication. And we'll talk about some basic discoveries that have been made. And we'll try to answer, at least in part, are there indeed hidden codes in the Bible? And if so, what do they mean? What people are talking about, uh, the Bible codes that uh, are being promoted by Michael Drosnan's uh, best-selling book called The Bible Code. Uh, We'll talk a little bit about that. That book is attacked by both sides, those that are proponents of the codes and those that are critics of the codes. Both attack his book because even though it's a very popular book, it's unfortunately rather contrived and so forth. The secret codes, we've been interested, all of us, I think, have been fascinated by secret codes ever since we were kids in one kind or another. Uh, And, of course, it's been uh, extolled in the literature, Uh, Edgar Allan Poe's famous story, The Gold Bug, uh, still remains as one of the classics of uh, stories in which the whole thing hangs upon the discovery of and then the deciphering of a secret code. Sir Arthur Conan Doyle and his uh, creation of Sherlock Holmes is, of course, uh, uh, turns out his man Sherlock Holmes is an expert in cryptography also, and we find in The Adventure of the Dancing Men that Sherlock Holmes recognized that these funny little stick figures that uh, are, are not just some kind of embroidery, that they are, in fact, a encryption, and he breaks the code and traps the thief with it, as, of course, only Sherlock Holmes can. And, uh, but even in more recent times, uh, Carl Sagan, who uh, wrote a novel called Contact, which, of course, has been made into a blockbuster movie that I imagine most of you have seen, uh, that movie also takes advantage of an extraterrestrial code that's three-dimensional and a very creative novel, quite a story, and a well-made movie. But uh, the most serious codes are codes of war. 
And uh, we'll touch a little bit about that as we go through. I think all of us uh, probably have heard at one time or another of the famous encryption machines, the Enigma machines of Nazi Germany that rendered a code that was considered invulnerable. And the Japanese uh, did a rendering of it too. These, of course, derived from uh, Alberti's cipher disks and Cardano's auto key from the Middle Ages, from the Renaissance period. We'll talk a little bit about that. But it's interesting that the uh, Germans had broken the American code, which in those days was called black. But one of the main milestones in World War II was on October 23rd of 1942 when General Rummel and his much vaunted Africa Corps were defeated at El Alamein. What most people don't realize is that up till El Alamein, the Germans had the advantage of reading our codes. But we discovered that finally. And what happened at El Alamein, the tables were reversed. And as Churchill said, we never had a victory until El Alamein. But after El Alamein, we never had a defeat. And what turned the tide, of course, was the turning the tide of our cryptology at that time. And that continued during World War II in London. They had a super secret project called Project Ultra, which unknown to the Germans, had cracked their code, the Enigma code. And uh, there are two world-class mathematicians that, will be, that have gone down in history. One is Alan Turing of London and John von Neumann of the United States. And these two brilliant mathematicians were very much behind. They were the brain trust, if you will, of the Ultra Project. And they were able to not only break Enigma, but keep up with its continuing permutations. And our ability to read their codes was a major, major part of our success during the war. What's interesting is the Japanese took a version of Enigma and advanced it, and it was codenamed by the Americans as Purple. William Friedman worked day and night for about 20 months. He ultimately had a nervous breakdown as a result of this effort, but he was able to crack the Japanese Purple code. In fact, one morning, he deciphered one of their codes, which announced the day and the hour of Pearl Harbor. And it's a very dramatic story. As he, his pulse quickening, uh, runs through the streets of Washington early that morning to his superiors to warn them of this uh, cracking of the Japanese code and the forthcoming attack on Pearl Harbor. But uh, it's kind of interesting the Germans had discovered that we'd cracked purple and leaked it to Tokyo, but Tokyo didn't believe it because they knew their code was invulnerable. Well, when Friedman cracked the code and discovered the message, unraveled a message that mentioned the day and hour of Pearl Harbor, his superiors didn't believe it. They just couldn't believe it was true. It was too preposterous, so they chose to ignore it. And, of course, you know the story of Pearl Harbor. This anecdote not only dramatizes the urgency of codes, especially in terms of, in terms of national security, but it's also interesting that uh, both the Japanese with regards to their own code, the information that their code was cr cracked, and also the, the naval uh, seniors that dismissed William Friedman. William Friedman was the head of the fledgling little organization called the Signal Information Service that later became the National Security Agency, our largest and most uh, well-resourced of all our, of our seven major intelligence agencies. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a, in a bit. But it's interesting that the tendency today of many biblical scholars to dismiss out of hand the codes in the Bible are, seem to echo in my mind the same skepticism that uh, characterized those situations back in World War II. But one of the questions that we all must have is, are there really hidden messages in the Bible? There are people that say, now, wait a minute, God's truth is available to the common man without computers and, and, and deciphering equipment. That's certainly true. God's truth, his truth of redemption, his plan of redemption is available to any of us. Jesus himself said it would please the Father to release them to babes and hide them from the wise and prudent. So clearly that view is correct on the one hand. But it's a big mistake, I believe, by some very prominent writers to take the view that there's nothing in the Bible that the common man can, can't understand. There's a big difference in those two viewpoints. The fact that God's central truth about his redemption is available to any of us, independent of our intellect, training, background, what have you. That's certainly true, no question about it. But on the other hand, I think it's putting God in a strange box 
to argue that there's nothing in his word that we can't understand. That implies that we can understand everything he does, and that's absurd. In fact, God himself deals with this at several places, but one is Proverbs 25, 2, where he declares that it is the glory of God to conceal a thing, but the honor of kings to search out a matter. It says two things. It says God has hidden things here for our pursuit. But he also points out that the pursuit of his revealed truth is an honorable undertaking. It's the honor of kings to search out a matter. There is a gray area we'll talk about before we're through, but I'll mention it right up front. There's a difference between trying to search the codes to discover what God has revealed in his program. And there's a difference between that and using the Bible as some kind of Ouija board or tea leaves or instrument for divination. So there's two kinds of people, two kinds of enthusiasts I run into. Those that deny the codes altogether and those that are excessively enthusiastic about them. There's also, uh, among though the latter, there are people that are uh, getting into Bible codes for the wrong reasons, and they'll go down the wrong paths. And that's the attempt to use it for divination, which is expressly prohibited. But let's get into this a little bit. Let's just indulge me a little bit, and I'll give you a quick tutorial on methods of concealing uh, codes and messages. There are two kinds of ways of concealment. One is called steganography. And that's using invisible inks or hiding a message in a micro dot or putting it in the heel of a shoe, the mechanical ways of hiding the existence of a message at all. And we're obviously not concerned with that here. The other way of hiding a message is called cryptography. And cryptography indulges in two kinds of cryptograms. One is called a code. Most of us use that term very broadly, but in the field, it's used very definitively, and I'll explain what a code is in a minute, as in contrast to a cipher. Codes and ciphers are different in the, in, within the trade. I'm speaking now from the a viewpoint of cryptology. And what we're going to be mostly interested in are ciphers, not codes, as you will see. And there's two kinds of ciphers, transposition and substitution. Now, let me just mention codes and dismiss them for a moment. A code is a prearranged signal. Let me give you the classic, simplest example. And that was Paul Revere as he stood on the bank looking across at the Old North Church. And he watched to see the lanterns. And if there was uh, one if by land, two if by sea, was the code. And that was a prearranged signal. And so he waited there and he watched the Old North Church. He saw the lantern go on and he paused and a second lantern. And so then he quickly uh, knew they were coming by sea, mounted his horse to spread the word. It was a very critical military piece of military intelligence. The point being is that was just a prearranged signal as such. If the British had the most modern computers in the world, there's no way they could have unraveled one or two, those one or two bits, if you will. A code is typically depends on a code book in real life. The number uh, 976 might mean some particular thing that you look up in a, in a, in a code book. That's what a code is, really. Some people use, have used during wartime, and they're in the field undercover, they've used the Gideon Bible as a code book. And what you send to your partner is a series of numbers that represent the page, the sentence, and the word in the Bible. And you send them a series of numbers, and unless you know what the code book is, in this case it's a commonly available code book that's available in any hotel room, and you can use that in effect to create a message. Those things are, are used, but they have some serious limitations. The most modern cryptographic communication occurs with ciphers as opposed to codes, and a cipher is one in which you take your message and you do one of two things, or combination thereof, these two things. You transpose the letters or you substitute for the letters, and we'll talk about that. That's really what we're interested in here. Now, this, the first form of, of ciphers are called transposition ciphers. That's where all you do is change the order of things. The oldest, one of the oldest forms of uh, transposition ciphers occurred with a staff. What a person would do in the ancient days, he would take a strip of parchment and he would wrap it on the staff so that the edges touched and he'd write his message horizontally around the staff and then unravel it. And when you saw the strip, you'd just have a whole bunch of letters. And he would send that. All his receiver needed was a staff of exactly the same diameter, and he would wrap it and unravel the message. 
That happens to be called a sky tail, just by historical reasons. And a sky tail is also happens to be in, in the uh, logo of the American uh, Cryptogram Association, which is the uh, club of, of amateur cryptographers. But it's obviously not very useful. It happens to be, by the way, uh, a equidistant letter sequence, the same kind of codes we find in the Bible, strangely, but for different reasons. A more common uh, use, more effective than that, that obviously was very easy to intercept and break, Let's take what's called a rail fence cipher. This is one of the simplest ciphers that are used among uh, people who play games. A lot of people like to do crossword puzzles as sort of a recreation. How many of you do pro crossword puzzles? Well, see, some people would say the ultimate crossword puzzle is a cryptogram. And there are columns and clubs and stuff. People that just love to try to break uh, the cryptograms. And one of the most common ones is what's called a rail fence cipher. Let's just, and by the way, in the field of cryptology, the text that you're trying to preserve or understand or whatever is called the plain text. That's the unencrypted text, the plain text. And let's assume our message is please help now. One of the things we can do is write it up and down, as you see on the screen, in sort of a, a zigzag fashion. And here we just take please help now. We lay it out that way. And then we simply read across the top, the P-H-N, the L-E-E-E, -E -E, et cetera. And so our cipher text of that plain text would be that stream of letters reading this rail fence cipher horizontally. And it's easier to see than it is to describe, but um, basically that's one way of scrambling these. It happens uh, to be a very easy one to break, as you can probably imagine. You can make some stabs at how many levels the guy has used in his rail fence, and it, it generally quickly will yield to analysis. But uh, a more advanced form of that same idea that gets much, much more sophisticated is what's called a columnar transposition. You know, it's transposing by columns. And in the field, they don't call, they don't speak of transpositions. They use an abbreviation. And you can't say transp very easily. So the street language for a transposition is a tramp. It's just a, they call them columnar tramps, but it, it's just a shorthand for columnar transposition. Here's the, here is a message within six, written out in six columns. Cinderella, be home before midnight. Okay, so it's just an example, obviously. But it's written first, uh, just across in six, uh, uh, in horizontally, but keep maintaining six columns. Now, what you could do, of course, is just rewrite this then vertically. C-E-H-F-D, et cetera. But there's a, a better way to do this. Typically, two people exchanging uh, cryptograms have a code word associated with them. In this way, or a keyword, a keyword or a code word. In this case, let's assume you out there in the field and uh, myself here had agreed that the word darkly is our code word. Now, this might be something we could change from time to time over a phone or whatever. But if the keyword is darkly, what they typically would do is alphabetize the letters in the keyword and then use those as a key as to what order to use the columns. In other words, darkly would become A-D-K-L-R-Y, putting the letters in darkly alphabetical. And A turns out to be the second letter in darkly, so it's the first column is two. D is the first letter. In other words, if you take them in alphabetical order and then take the number in which they appear in that word, that's a simple way of reshuffling the columns. Then with those numbers, I write the transposition vertically, but taking the columns in that order. So the first column that I'd write is the second column in, in here. So you see, if I number these columns one through six, I'll take the, uh, the first vertical string from the second column, then the first, then the fourth, then the fifth, then the third, and the sixth, that, that order. And so my ciphertext then looks like what you see at the bottom of the screen the I, L, double O, N being the vertical uh, lineup of the second column, etc. Something else you'll notice right away, it's typical to take an encryption and group it in, in clusters of five letters just to make it easy to count them. You never, I should say rarely, do you ever preserve the spaces, which leads to the first point in cryptography. In cryptography, you generally don't have spaces between the words because that's a tip-off, generally. There's some other things you'll discover as we go, but that's one of the things. Now, another technique that was developed uh, very, very early, we're talking, uh, you know, uh, before the 15th century, etc., 
one of the Renaissance men who also happened to be a... Most you'll discover something else. The great men, I'm, I'm sparing you a whole historical buildup here, but, but uh, the great men of cryptology of the past were typically also Jewish Kabbalists. The Jewish scribes, centuries before Christ, indulged in all kinds of letter games. We'll talk about some of those as we go. And cryptology didn't advance much until about the 13th, 14th century, which happened to be the flowering period of the Talmudic sages, but it also was the time in Europe in the Renaissance where cryptology, for a variety of reasons, just flowered. And most of the great men in cryptology also came, for, interestingly enough, from that Hebrew background. One of these was Cardano, and he, one of the techniques he indulged in was to create a grill, which is known as the Cardano grill. What you do is you take a piece of cardboard or metal or whatever, and you cut out holes in it. You can cut them out wherever you like, but the idea is you need to make two of them. You have one, and the receiver, your correspondent, needs one. And let's assume now we took a message, and I'm using a clumsy example here, for leverage try-only serials listed in Social Lovers editions. You say, what does that mean? doesn't matter, because what you really want to do, watch carefully, you want to take your Cardano grill that you've hidden away in your secret place, and you lay that over the message, and then you read just the letters that show through the holes. Now, in this case, if you read those letters, it says, flee at once, all is discovered. And so that's a very simple way of having a code. And obviously, the notion here is that if and someone who intercepts that note, unless he happens to have a grill exactly like you and your, your partner has, he has no chance of breaking it. That turns out not to be true, incidentally. And one of the problems with a Cardano grill... And one reason I selected this as an example, because I want you to notice a defect of it. Let's assume you've gone ahead and written your message, flee at once, all is discovered, through that grill. You're then faced, as I was for the slide, to come up with a message. You fill in the other blanks with just with letters to make it look like a normal note. Well, it turns out that's not easy to do. You, know, you take a page and just put some random letters on it, and then try to fill in between them words that make the thing sound like a love note or an instruction or whatever. Do you follow me? It sounds easy, but it takes a great deal of imagination to really do it well. And obviously, I've done it poorly here for two reasons. One is I'm not that skilled. But secondly, it may, I wanted to highlight a point. If you saw this message, you would begin to sense that there's something fishy about it. See, it doesn't make sense. So because it doesn't make sense, or, or there's, there's a hint that there's something deeper. In the Hebrew, that's called a remez, and it's a, a thing that the rabbis use even today with the Old Testament text, and I'll come back to that. So that's a major defect of the Cardano grill. A variation of the Cardano grill was what was used by the French and the Germans in the First World War uh, called the turning grill. It's possible, and you can design these for any number of characters, but I'm using here as an example a 6x6 grill. That allows you 6 times 6, or 36 letters. It's possible to punch out holes, one letter each, in such a way that as you turn this grill in four different positions, it will cover all the squares, as you'll see in a minute. Let's assume you had this grill, and instead of a message, I'm just going to use numbers 1 through 9. The first 9 of your numbers, you just put in those holes. Now, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9. Then what you do is you take your grill and you turn it 90 degrees and you fill in the ones that are then exposed, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, and 18. Then again, you turn it another 90 degrees and fill in the remainder. And then you do it once again and fill in those remainders and you now have your 36 letters rearranged in a very unusual way. Now you say, gee, what if I don't have 36 letters in my message? It's not a problem. You put in what are called nulls. You throw in X's or something, whatever, to fill it out so you have the square. That's the idea. You could also design these for any square grill you want. This looks very, very... You can imagine that if you've got the letters in that kind of a thing, it would really be a formidable code to break. That turns out not to be true. These codes lasted only four months before they were broken and became... Uh, useless in the war. It turns out that these controversial equidistant letter sequences that we find uh, being talked about that appear to be in the Bible are simply 
like a Cardano grill, but with the simplest possible formula. Instead of, see, with, instead of a grill with all the little holes cut out, you could just agree that every fifth letter or every third letter or whatever, if you had the formula for creating the grill, it's the same thing as having the grill. Any fixed sequence of skipped letters is in effect a Cardano grill, and that's what we're going to find is in our Bible and someplace else that's very, very surprising. Someplace else that's very, very surprising. I'll come back to that later. Now, these equidistant letter sequences, you quickly will discover, are not very useful for secrecy. A fixed letter sequence is easy to break. That's why they're breaking them. Okay? But they are useful for another reason. And that's to authenticate a source. And let me explain what I mean by that. Let's assume you're in a foreign country, you're operating undercover as a secret agent, and they know you're there. They don't know who is the secret agent, but they know they've been compromised. There's a mole in headquarters or something. So what your host country has done is they start generating all kinds of letters, uh, notes, uh, messages, and they drown you. Your problem is you've got all these messages. You don't know which one is really from your control, from your headquarters. So how do you solve that problem? Your life depends on figuring out which of these letters is the genuine one, which one isn't. And the way you do that, of course, is to find have methods of authentication. And methods of authentication, obviously, typically, rely upon having some attribute of that message that's known only to you and your sender, that eludes the ability to counterfeit it. And we're going to discover that's exactly what happens in these 66 messages that we've brought with us to this meeting tonight. Now, before I go on, let me talk about another kind of code. We've talked so far about transposition ciphers, ciphers where that depend on simply scrambling letters that are uh, of the plain text. A far more powerful form of encryption is to substitute different letters or symbols for each of the uh, letters in your message. And we're going to talk, the simplest form of this is what's called a monoalphabet. That's where you create a cipher alphabet, and you use that alphabet, and I'll show you that in a minute. There's also polyalphabetic and polygraphic ones and some other things we'll talk about in a minute. But let's get to these monographic. The first, the first one I'm going to use is the simplest form of monoalphabetic cipher you can have. And let's assume your plain text message you're trying to encrypt is, this is a fascinating book, just a simple sentence. What you could choose to do is to substitute for each of those letters the third letter next in the alphabet. In other words, instead of the T, there's U, V, W, you'd put a W for the T, etc. And then your ciphertext then would simply be a stream of letters. In each case is three letters further in the alphabet, a fixed sequence of shifts, if you will. And you obviously would group them in groups of five, not with the word breaks in the plain text, so you won't tip off the word breaks. And that's, again, typical practice. Now, this is called, for historical reasons, a Caesar cipher. I mention it only because the next step in this, later on we'll talk about, is where the shift of the alphabet is not a fixed number, but a variable number somehow. And that starts to get very, very complicated. Now, Generally, cipher al the simplest form of cipher alphabets is where you have one-on-one -on -one mapping. For example, you could take your alphabet A through Z, then you take an alphabet and shuffle it and match it. So in, this is the, the blue letters on the slide would be the cipher text letters. The, the uh, uh, yellow ones or gold ones are, are, would be the plain text. So what you would do is simply uh, substitute for the plain text the corresponding cipher text. For example, the word enemy would become SWSHP because the E of the enemy would be, substitute, it would be substituted by an S and the N by a W, uh, the E by another S, uh, the uh, M by an H, and the P by a Y. Going the other way, if you had the RIS as a code, you would plug it into your uh, alphabet here, and the, RS would, the R would become an F, the I, the O, and the S would be an E, and you'd decrypt it backwards. This one-on-one this -on -one mapping is typically the kind, the kind of uh, text that uh, is usually facilitated by a cipher wheel, where you have the alphabet and then some mixed alphabet. And these are also sometimes little code wheels that uh, they sell on, on the back of uh, cereal boxes and things for kids. But it's a one-on-one -on -one mapping concept. Now, it doesn't take much imagination to realize that that has some deficiencies. In fact, back here, you'll notice that even with the word enemy, 
and the word fo, you'll notice that the S's appear as frequently as the E's. Anybody that's trying to break code knows that there's a frequency behavior. E is the most common letter. So the most common letter in your ciphertext is, has at least is suspicious of being an E and that you'd like to break that down. So one way to do that is not to have a fixed alphabet, but to have multiple alphabets. And Leon Battista Alberti in the 15th century is one of the great pioneers. Many of the adv major advances in cryptography are attributed to him. He invented a thing called the Viganer polyalphabetic cipher. Another guy's name is attached to it somehow through history, but it was really Alberti's invention. We'll talk about that in a minute. It's like a Caesar's cipher that we talked about, except there's a variable rotation. The alphabet is continually changed at each letter. That makes it pretty tough to, to and there's some other variations I'll spare you. If you look at, this is called a Wegener table, and basically you have uh, the alphabet A through Z, but then you copy a second copy of it where you shift it one. It starts at B, goes through Z, and then A, and you keep shifting it one for 26 times, and you'll label each one of these with a letter. So you've got a two-way table here, very easy to construct. You have that handy when you're doing this. What you typically do is you, first of all, when you're going to encrypt, you have a code word that's agreed between you and your partner. Now, in this particular case, I'm going to assume that we've just decided long ago that you and I are going to use a code word, a keyword, called DOG. D-O-G is our code word. Now, let's assume, to make this example very simple, but you'll quickly get the idea, I'm going to assume that I want to encrypt the name Jim. So my first problem, I have a keyword D, so I, I, look at, I find the D across the top, and uh, I find the J for Jim along the plain text. I move in both column and row, and I pick up the M where those two intersect. And so the first letter in my ciphertext is an M. For my second letter, I go to the second letter of the keyword, which is an O. I go to the second letter of my plain text, which is an I, and I move into the column and row represented by those two letters, and I have a W. So W becomes the second letter of my ciphertext. It's quicker to do than it is to talk about it. The next letter of my keyword would be um, third letter of the dog. Third letter of my plain text is an M, so I go to the row and column uh, represented by that, and I pick up my S. And so my first three letters become MWS. The point being, I have used three different alphabets to encrypt this. What I would continue to do if my message was longer is I would always use, I just keep, I'd, I'd write my message and put dog, 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 dog across and always use the intersection of those two. You quickly, it obviously makes more sense to have a longer keyword than dog. I use this just to make a simple slide. The longer the key, the point is every time, every letter in my keyword gives me a different alphabet to encrypt. And that makes it a very, very powerful form of encryption. Now there, you can make this whole process dynamic. In fact, uh, Wegener, for whom this is named, developed what he called the auto key. And what he did after the first letter, what he used was the, the ciphertext result as the key to the key for the next letter. So it was a continually mutating alphabet that changed depending on what the message was. Very, very powerful technique. And uh, in effect, what he really did, and I won't go through an example, it'll just take us too long, I just want to get you, I want you to get the flavor of these things, is that if each letter of the encrypted, as you build up your encryption, the last letter you developed becomes the key to the next one. So you, in effect, make the top row not a keyword. It then becomes the previous ciphertext letter, if you will. This leads to another invention that Blaise de Venier almost, almost developed. He came close to it, didn't quite. What developed was the one, what's called the one-time pad. This is probably the only form of cryptography that is unbreakable. And what it depends on is having, you need, in order to have a code unbreakable, you need a key that is as long as the message. It needs to be totally random, and it must never be reused. If you can meet those three criteria, it is unbreakable. It's the only code that is unbreakable. Now, the way you implement this is to build tablets of random numbers, but you have two, so your associates and yours match and then you use those to build your encryptions, if you will. And uh, it's a tricky business, but it is unbreakable. And so 
Modern ciphers use millions of continually changing cipher alphabets, and they obviously do this with machinery. There's another type of cipher I want to make you just sensitive to, and that's up till now we've had each letter stand on its own. Each letter was translated. There is a power when you start using letters together. They're called polygraphic ciphers, where two or more letters operate together. And I'm going to give you an example of one that the German spies used, well, the British used earlier in the World War I time period, Boer War and others, and the Germans actually used it in America during World War II. And it starts by building a little simple, five, take your alphabet and make a five by five matrix out of it. And I'm showing you one here that just goes A through Z. And they generally, to make it 25 rather than 26 letters, they usually agree to use I and J as the same letter. It's a little awkward, but it works. And that way you've got a five by five matrix, which is what you're after, as you'll see in a minute. I'm also showing you this where the alphabet just goes A through Z. This is not the way it's normally done. What, the, what you want to do is have a code word or code phrase that you both agree on. You put the letters from that code phrase in here first, never repeating. You take the letters in the, of the alphabet in the order that they're in that phrase and put those first, and whatever's left over, you put at the end. Do you follow me? That way, the arrangement here is not predictable to a stranger. You say, that sounds like kind of clumsy. No, it isn't. There's actually a very popular way of doing this. What the Germans did is they would use a Gideon Bible in a hotel room. And they would use the book of Proverbs, and they would take the chapter for the day of the week. I mean the day, because there's 31 chapters. And then they would take the verse that corresponds to the month. There's no verses, there's no chapters there that have more than 12 verses. Or, I mean, less than 12 verses. So by, you, by knowing the date, and you, if you date the note, by knowing that date, you go to a Gideon Bible, you can take that verse, you can take the, the alphabet in the order it's in that verse, plug it in here, and you're, you've got your keyword taken care of. But then what they did... Let's assume our plain text, take something very simple, well, it must come now. The first thing they do is take those in pairs. They take the MU, then the ST, and they always take them in pairs because we're going to encrypt not letters, but letter pairs. Very interesting idea here. And obviously, since there's an odd number of letters, we throw an X in there just to make it come out even. And what we do then, the M and U on our little array here become the diagonal of a rectangle. And we simply take the other pair of letters opposite that, where the MU, see the little rectangle, we take, become RP. So the first two letters get enciphered to RP. The next two letters are ST, and there again we have a rectangle. In this case, they're on the same row, so we just take the letters below them, XY. The next pair of letters is a, a CO, and they become the ND. Again, because they're, uh, see, the ND is, um, the CO represents a rectangle, the ND is in the opposite corner of it. And the ME, again, is the opposite. Uh, it it's becomes the diagonal of a rectangle. The opposite ones are the BP. The NO are together, so we take the ones below. And the WX are below, and we just assume a wraparound, get the BC at the top. You say that seems like a strange way to go thing. It, a very, it's, a, it's the kind of thing that requires no special equipment. You can do it in any hotel room. And it turns out to be tough to break. And the ciphertext, of course, then is rewritten in groups of five uh, in standard form. This undercuts some of the major tools, monographic tools, of a frequency analysis that a, a cryptanalyst would use because it obliterates the single letter characteristics. It cuts in half the number of elements that are being encrypted, and it also, the number of possible digraphs are, uh, exceed the number of letters uh, uh, that are available. So it's a very, it turns out statistically, it's a very powerful technique. So... We've talked about monoalphabets, Caesar one-way mapping. We've talked about polyalphabetic kinds of encryptions. We've talked about polygraphic techniques. There's another last thing I'll just mention for your background called block substitution, where you take blocks of information and you have much more powerful techniques there. One of the examples of this in modern days is the National Bureau of Standards Data Encryption Standard. And this is a, uh, a standard that uses 64-bit keys that controls 17 stages of polyalphabetic substitutions, which alternate with 16 different transpositions. So by the time you crunch all that, it has a very high level, not perfect, but a very, very high level encryption. And this is dear to me because when I was chairman of Western Digital, we really say what got Western Digital out of bankruptcy is we were the first to put this on a single chip for commercial use. And that was not that big a deal, but it did bring the company out of Chapter 11, and it was dear to my heart as one of our projects. 
But what this does require virtually is an exhaustive search of two to the 64th power keys. Now, a fast computer can do that, and so these things are breakable, but only with an enormous amount of computer crunching. Now, there's other topics we could talk about. There are fractionating schemes where you, you can uh, render your message into a matrix, and then you can do mathematical operations on the matrix, and I won't get into those here. Uh, there are also a strange thing that's developed called one-way keys. It's possible to develop a form of encryption in which I can make the key public. It takes a different key to, in, to encrypt than it does to, to uh, decipher. So I give you what's called the public key. If you send me a message encrypting it with that key, nobody can unravel it except me. Even though you have the key to encipher it, you don't have the key to decipher it. It's a very strange mathematical phenomenon. They're called one-way keys, which means that they can be used publicly, not just for encryption, but for also authenticating signatures. Because in the Department of Defense uh, contract world and so forth, you can actually uh, commit to things in an encrypted form. We can prove that you were the one that okayed the drawing or whatever because of the one-way key. Only you have the key and and so forth. So there are ways to do that. So uh, if you're interested in this kind of thing, it's available on the Internet. There's a thing called PGP, means for pretty good protection. There are all kinds of modern, very advanced uh, encryption techniques that uh, department, the uh, U.S. government is very upset about because they've gotten out in the public domain. And uh, you can get these on the Internet if you're really interested in that sort of thing. These devices, Cypher, uh, Alberti made his, Alberti made his uh, Cypher disks. Wheatstone made a similar thing. These mechanical aids to make to do encryption, of course, started to develop through the years. Uh, Thomas Jefferson, our president, had uh, invented a certain kind of variation that's called the Thomas Jefferson wheel. But this finally climaxes to a guy by the name of Charles Babbage, who was busy making tables, and he took those ideas and made a very elaborate version of it that became the first computer, the first computer, the Babbage uh, differential engines. These things also became the background that the Germans picked up on to make the Enigma machines that became so famous in World War II. And, of course, were ultimately defeated by Alan Turing and John von Neumann's uh, programmable machines that, from which came our modern computer. John von Neumann was the guy that recognized the power in putting a program. See, the only difference between a computer and a calculator is that is a computer is a calculator that pushes its own buttons, in effect because the, the program that the computer follows is in memory, which means the computer can modify its program. And you now start to have self-modifying machines, and that's where you start getting into cognitive behavior, you start getting into artificial intelligence and the rest. And that's, that's really the breakthrough. That leads to what you and I know as modern computers. What fascinates me is the way the ellipse is closed, because Alberti's cipher disk and these encryption techniques had their roots in the Kabbalah, the ancient Hebrew texts, which we'll see shortly. From that came the cipher disk, which came the machines, from which came the computer, and now it's the computer that are rediscovering what the ancient Kabbalists had discovered thousands of years ago, and we're going to get into that shortly. Now, a related field to cryptology is paracryptology. Uh, Egyptian hieroglyphics being perhaps the most the classic example. Hieroglyphics have fascinated people for centuries because they're so mysterious, but uh, Jean-Francois. Uh, Campoian uh, is the one that really cracked them using cryptographic techniques. There's a close relationship between cryptology and trying to decipher the language of a lost culture. There are some differences because the language of a lost culture did not have as its design secrecy, you see, so it, it has that advantage. But on the other hand, you've got the problem of trying to get an insight from scratch as to what the various symbols and things meant. Another example is Henry Rawlinson was climbing. There's a huge cliff at the Histun in which is engraved in three languages, Babylonian, Old Persian, and Elamite. It's very similar to a Rosetta Stone kind of thing. But he cl uh, clinging like a fly to this giant prehistoric billboard. He copied this and cracked uh, the, these ancient languages. And so that's a whole area of reading. But having said all that, what interests probably the greatest challenge in the minds of the people who are into this thing is the challenge of deciphering messages of extraterrestrial origin. And back in 1961, they undertook the Project Ozma, where they put a special receiver on a radio telescope and they tried to listen for signals from outer space. And they did that for four months without any real 
uh, tangible result, but they were uh, nevertheless trying. In 1971, there was a conference where 84 of the top scientists on the planet Earth, American and, and Soviet and others, that met at uh, Bukharatan, Russia, with the National Academy of Sciences of the Soviet Union, co-sponsored with the National Academy of Sciences of the United States. These 84 guys uh, in 1971 met in a conference to explore the problems and likelihoods and so forth with communication with extraterrestrial intelligence. The proceedings of that conference are available and translated into English, and they're very fascinating reading because these 84 scientists, in effect, as they address this problem, also find themselves pointing out to themselves that the very existence of life is unique. There's absolutely no statistical basis. In other words, it's a refutation in great erudite terms of the whole theory of evolution, in effect, although that was not their intent. Well, out of that, of course, came the project called the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. We all probably have heard about where there, there's diligent attempts to try to f listen for uh, intercepts from outer space. And as you listen for these signals, you want something that is... Most things are either periodic, repeatable, that which means they probably have a natural source, or they're straight noise, they're totally random. The signal you're looking for is something in between, not random and not periodic. That's the dilemma. It may surprise you to discover that they have actually, you know, most of us see the movie Contact and assume, well, that's just fiction, it's kind of fun, but it's fiction. There actually have been 37 uh, intercepts by the SETI organization of messages, uh, apparent messages from outer space. The problem is they don't repeat. They're unique and don't repeat. They've been published in the Journal of Astronautics and Aeronautics, but uh, they don't know what to do with them because they're not repeatable. So it's a matter of record, but they don't know what to do with it. Not enough to decode. I, I'll spare you because it's getting late. Going through the history of science from Descartes on all the scientists and mathematicians that have spent their time trying to figure out what would an extraterrestrial language, what kind of requirements would it have to meet? There's a bunch of these. Uh, it quickly becomes clear that they have to meet certain statistical tests. Jean-Francois Soudre uh, proposed a seven-note, seven-color kind of alphabet for extraterrestrial communication. That was just his proposal. I mention it only because it's an interesting proposal because uh, Spielberg picked up on that. He took a five-note, five-color scheme in his blockbuster movie and so forth that called Close Encounters of the Third Kind. But he's really leaning on Souter's uh, technical work way back long ago. Alfred North Whitehead, Bertrand Russell have written the basic foundation for this, uh, that mathematics and logic are actually identical and would have to underlie any such language. Dr. Hans Freudenthal is famous as having really formulated the first uh, a language for interstellar use called Linkos, and I won't go into this. They're just, they're just studies to try to explore what some of the problems are. Now, Pioneer 10, which was the first space vehicle that was put on a trajectory that would go beyond our solar system. And as it left our solar system, of course, it, uh, it, it was a big fanfare. And knowing that it was going to do that, they put a plaque on it. And the intent of the plaque was should whenever, millions of years from now or whenever, some outside extraterrestrial civilization encounters this thing, they'll find this plaque, and this plaque had the burden of somehow trying to communicate to them some things about us. Now, I have a little cartoon I, did, I refrain from putting in here, but it says that one guy, you know, one, one space being says to another space being, do you all we know about the earth people is they don't wear clothes. <laughs> But um, the intent was to indicate that people, uh, there's all kinds of mathematic, basic scientific mathematical relationships on the plaque, uh, proportions of our planets in our solar system, uh, the, the, uh, uh, all kinds of binary and mathematical things. But anyway, it's, it was an attempt. But the retreat to pictures is interesting because most people presume that a basic communication will involve pictures because they're concrete. Arthur C. Clarke has suggested that. One of the oldest languages on the planet Earth, of course, is Chinese, and Chinese consists of pictographs. You say, well, that seems very natural, except there's some problems with pictographs. How does a pictograph portray an abstract concept? A little tough. Pictures have their limitations. One of the startling discoveries of just, just the last few decades... See, China, well, it's one of the few civilizations that can point to a 4,500-year history of their development. And most of us think of China in terms of Taoism, Buddhism, or Confucianism, but that's all since the 5th century B.C. forward. Their religion goes back several thousand years prior to that, and it was a worship of one god. 
They've discovered by studying the pictographs, the pictographs for abstract concepts convey those concepts by the presumption that the viewer knows the stories of Genesis 3. And that's a startling discovery. It demonstrates that the Chinese, original Chinese, apparently had awareness of, common awareness of, the stories of Genesis, of the early chapters of Genesis. Very, very interesting discovery. I know, monotheistic culture. But I won't spend our time on that. But pictures make sense. Skull and crossbones on a medicine bottle means many things in many languages. We see it on road signs, chemical formulas, notes of music, Arabic numerals. All these are, of course, symbols of wide application. But what, if you saw an extraterrestrial language today, how would you recognize it if you saw it? What would be its characteristics? Would it be pictorial, conceptual, or phonetic? Most of our alphabets are phonetic. They're like sounds, but they're meaningless, except to the fact that you've learned those sounds. What kind of a language would it look like? How would the language be parsing? In other words, we're used to a string of letters broken with spaces for words and periods for sentences. How would an extraterrestrial language parse itself? It would somehow have to be self-parsing other than just a random string of letters. Another question has to do with the use of redundancy. I have a group of letters here that are, by themselves are really meaningless. But I'm going to fill in a couple of letters in green. And then these letters, this little sentence says, A blessed friend brought breath and ease again. Makes sense, doesn't it? I can take those same letters that I started with that are meaningless and put in a different set of letters. Um, a cursed fiend wrought death, disease, and pain. Now those two sentences are very, very different. But 65% of the letters are identical. The ones that are identical, I could argue, are redundant. They carry no information. The information is carried by the red or the green letters in the slide. It turns out that English is about 40, uh, excuse me, 75% redundant. And uh, that has an advantage and a disadvantage. The advantage is that if you lose some letters in transmission, you can usually figure out what the guy was trying to get across. So it has re the redundancy is good. On the other hand, it's taking up space. It takes me more than twice, two and a half times as much space to write English as it would uh, having that redundancy gone. We'll discover in English that vowels pretty much are redundant. So most cryptographers will drop vowels before encryption because all cryptography hangs on redundancy. All the breaking of codes depends on the redundancy that's in the language. On the other hand, redundancy is good because it improves the signal-to-noise ratio. And uh, so one of the questions is, what will an extraterrestrial language look like? It's likely to be non-redundant, so it maximizes the bandwidth, and it will use some other techniques to correct errors. Well, let's talk about some other discoveries. If I talk about trigonometry, and I mention a triangle, and I add the angles in a triangle, what does it add up to? 180 degrees, whether it's a 30, 60, 90 triangle, or a 45, 45, 90, it always adds up to 100 degrees. Well, suppose um, I go out in the field with a transit and lay out a very large triangle, take down the angles and bring them into you, and you add up the angles and it adds up to more than 180 degrees. You figure, what would you think? Well, I, Chuck screwed up again. Now, it turns out, that that little rule we all learned, that the angles add up to 180 degrees, is true for a universe of only two dimensions. It's called plane geometry or plane trigonometry. If we have a triangle of less than 180 degrees, it's in a concave surface. If it's in more than 180 degrees, it's in a convex surface. Of course, in navigation, uh, you'll quickly have to learn something about spherical trigonometry, where you can have a triangle with 90 degrees in each corner. And uh, it was this kind of insight that Dr. Einstein was grappling with. He realized, as he was grappling with problems of our space and time reality, he realized that space is not just three dimensions. The way he solved his problem is to realize that there were four dimensions. And that led to a special theory of relativity with length, mass, and velocity and time are relative. And that was generalized ten years later in this general theory of relativity. And the key thing for us is that he recognized that there's no distinction between time and space. A physicist will generally not speak of space or time separately, he'll speak of space-time. We live in a four-dimensional continuum. This has been confirmed more than 12 ways uh, to more than 14 decimal. So there's four dimensions. Now, uh, you and I tend to think of time as linear. When we were in school, someone wrote, uh, the teacher went to the blackboard and wrote a line from left to right. 
the beginning of a, a segment would be a person's life, a birth, say, and the right end would be his death, or the beginning would be a founding of an empire, and the right end would be the end of that empire, whatever. You, how many of you made timelines in school? Okay, so you're with me. Well, because of that, when we think of eternity, we think of a line that starts at infinity on the left and goes to infinity on the right. When we think of God, we think of someone who has lots of time. That's very poetic. It's in our hymns, Amazing Grace, when we've been there 10,000 years and all that sort of thing. But it happens to be bad physics. God is not subject to gravity, not subject to mass, those constraints. God is not somebody who has lots of time. He's someone that's outside time altogether. Time is a physical property. We exist in more than three dimensions. Time varies with mass, acceleration, or gravity. If we have an atomic clock here on the platform and I raise it one meter, it speeds up by one part in 10 to the 16th. That's not a fault of the clock. Time actually speeds up because of the difference, the difference in gravity. In 1971, the United States Naval Observatory sent, put an atomic clock on an aircraft around the world eastward, left one at the observatory, and the one that went around the world lost 0.0 microseconds compared to the one at rest at the, university, at the observatory. And they did the same thing with another clock going westward, went around the world, uh, and it gained 0.27 microseconds. Not a lot, obviously a very, very tiny amount, but predictable and measurable and confirmed the theory. And the other example that's usually offered is that two astronauts, hypothetical astronauts, and we're going to leave one here on the Earth, we're going to, in our mind's eye, we're going to send the other one to the nearest star and back. The nearest star happens to be Alpha Centauri. It's about four and a half light years away. And if we apply the Lorentz transformations to this, it turns out that if we send him at 50% of the speed of light to the star four and a half light years away, take nine years to get there, nine years back, so the round trip will take 18 years on his calendar, except when he gets back to the Earth, he'll discover that his twin brother is uh, uh, two years and nine months um, older than he is, that he's, he's arrived uh, two years and nine months younger than his twin brother, born at the same instant. And if that doesn't bother you, you weren't listening carefully, Okay. To extend it one more, there's some other problems here, but let me just presume I could send him at 99.99% of the speed of light. In that case, the round trip to four and a half light years away would be take him nine years in his clock. But during that time, the Earth will have aged 636 years. And obviously, we hope he bought some Microsoft stock before he left. <laughs> My favorite quote of Dr. Einstein is that people like us who believe in physics, he said, know that the distinction uh, between the past, the present, and the future is only a stubbornly persistent illusion. So we really have uh, uh, two major discoveries that motivate our study here. We have in our possession, first of all, an integrated message system. We have 66 books penned by 40 different guys over thousands of years. So the first discovery is that it's an integrated message. Every detail, every number, every place name we, can, we, we discover is there by design. I'll show you how. Some of the codes reveal that, especially the macro codes. The other side of the coin, though, is not only that, but we can prove that the origin of this message system is from outside our time domain. And that's really the main power of these codes and one reason we're spending our time on them. We know these codes come from outside time, and this is the way God authenticates it. He says, that's what Isaiah means, is the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity. That's his, God is not somebody who has lots of time. He inhabits eternity. He's outside time altogether. And the way he authenticates his message is to demonstrate an attribute that he alone has, no other one does. Declaring the end from the beginning and from the ancient times of things that are not yet done, Isaiah tells us. God boasts that I alone know the end from the beginning. So when we find a message that demonstrates that its origin is from outside time, and it does that by writing history before it happens in such detail as to defy speculation, and does it with uh, perfect accuracy, we begin to realize that it is from whom we think it is. Now, we talked about time as a line. Here I'm trying to render it in three dimensions, as a, cur a line passing through three dimensions. And there are people in the past, we're here in the present, there are people coming in the future. From the point of view of eternity, those three uh, periods that we regard as sequential could appear in eternity as simultaneous. I'm just suggesting this to stretch your imagination a little bit. I also sometimes like to point out that uh, someone that died in the past, someone that died last week, and someone that might be raptured a week from Tuesday, all might arrive at the throne at the same instant. So that should bother you. Let's move on. <laughs> now, are there hidden codes in the Bible? 
It's the glory of God to conceal a thing, honor of kings to search out a matter. And I want to show you some quick transpositions here. There are codes in the Bible that are well known to anybody that's had a course in cryptology. If you take the Hebrew alphabet, and I'm showing it left to right here, which is really wrong, but I, I think we're more used to that. And I take the second half of the alphabet and put it underneath the first half. I now have a, a cipher alphabet. I can take any letter and substitute its counterpart in a message. And that technique is called in Hebrew, album. We find it in Isaiah chapter 6. The name Tabil turns out to be the name Ramallah encrypted by Albam. And what this does is reveal a hint about the plot of the kings in Isaiah 7, that if it had succeeded, what the result would have been. There's another form in which I reverse it. I take the second half and fold it under the others backwards. I just wrap it around, if you will, and build myself for cipher alphabet. And that form, that's called Atbash. We find it occurring in Jeremiah 25. And also Jeremiah 51. In both those cases, we encounter the word that's translated Shishak. Your commentaries will speculate that it's probably a suburb of Babylon because they can tell from the context that it's actually alluding to Babylon. But it's in the Midrash, we discover that it is a form of Atbash encryption of the name Babel or Babylon. So Shishak and Babylon are the same thing. One is the encryption of the other. We find the same technique called Atbash in Jeremiah 51, verse 1, where Leb Kamai is substituted, which means heart of, my, heart of my enemy, is encryption of Kajdim, which is the word for Chaldeans. Again, these aren't profound discoveries. They are just considered, among cryptologists, historical oddities that are embodied in the ancient Hebrew literature. But to someone who holds a supernatural view of the Bible's origins, these are what a, a rabbi would call a remez. It's a hint of something deeper. We have, of course, the fall of Babylon, where you all know the party that they had. Uh, Belshazzar was throwing this big party, and uh, for a thousand of his lords and nobles, when the Persians were presumably ready to attack, which was pretty stupid on his part, and right in the middle of the party, on the wall, they find some handwriting that none of the experts could unravel. And the queen mother, Nebuchadnezzar's widow, he'd passed away, of course. It was a grandson that was a co-regent on the throne. She says, there was a guy, that, your father, that could do these things, call them out of retirement, which they do. And Daniel comes by, and the Hebrew tradition is that this was encrypted in Atbash originally. But he translates these letters into the famous handwriting on the wall. Remember, Hebrew goes from right to left. Remember that. All languages go towards Jerusalem. Did you know that? See, all languages, the languages of Europe, uh, languages of countries west of Jerusalem, Latin, German, French, English, Spanish, you name it, all go from right to left. Languages east of Jerusalem, not just Hebrew, Aramaic, uh, Sanskrit, Arabic, Chinese, the rest, go from right to left. They all go to, anyway, uh, the language here on the slide goes from right to left, but the first word is many, which means numbered or reckoned. God hath numbered thy kingdom and finished it in the King James. Or as we might say, your number is up. <laughs> and then uh, the next one was tekel or weighed. Uh, thou art weighed in the balances and art found wanting. And the last word is perez, which is broken or divided. Thy kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. What most people don't realize is the vowels here. See, the other thing about Hebrew is there are no vowels. It's been designed for bandwidth compression for extraterrestrial transmission. I think that's very interesting. There are no vowels. And also discover later, it's, it's also self-parsing. It's the only language on the planet Earth that appears. It has those very characteristics that you would design in, in an alphabet. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about that tomorrow. But uh, Perez uh, means broken or divided if you infer an E. But if you infer an A, it's the name for the Persians. It's a pun, if you will, in the uh, Aramaic in which it's written. Now, the Bible Codes, as you know, Michael Drosnin's book, The Bible Codes, uh, Bible code is, is created this big sensation and it deals with just one kind of encryption called the equidistant letter sequences. And one of the questions you and I have is are there really hidden codes in the Bible? But uh, we will then go through and show you some of the most incredible demonstrations of the characteristics of the text when we reconvene.